to start off, how has the mining sector been affected by the Eurozone crisis? Primary industries in, in Europe evaporated some time ago to a large degree. It's affected the mining industry in, in terms of end user demand. It's been a much tougher for the steel sector, where costs really haven't come down. You've seen end user demand, the automotive sector, be badly effective, affected. And that, in turn, to some degree, has been demand which has been displaced and replaced by demand out of Asia and other emerging co economies. So the mining sector has really been driven by um, the the new economies, basically. Europe has been a hindrance in terms of access to finance, in terms of the makes markets very volatile, but uh, over and above that, we haven't seen too much of an effect. And which regions are being hardest hit? The regions being hit hardest hit by the Eurozone crisis in terms of how it affects uh, debt markets and, and equity markets are regions where there's a, a high degree of new development. Uh, those are where there's vast swathes of untapped uh, uh, geology, Africa being one of them. Uh, South America being another one, Asia Pacific being another one. But companies are very quickly adapting to not rely on traditional sources of financing. There's sovereign wealth, there's strategic investors, and of course mining companies' balance sheets and their capacity to absorb junior mining companies and finance projects uh, is still pretty strong. Balance sheets are, are not in bad shape at all. And which do you expect to take the longest to recover of the regions? Well, the um, regions, to the extent that they are in, um, in uh, recovery mode, I think that the, um, clearly you know, anything in and around Europe is going to take a long time to recover. Quite pleasingly, we're seeing quite a good recovery in the States, economically and from an industry point of view. And uh, I think the, the impact of, of cheap energy in the States and their ability to keep inflation quite low and keep interest low is actually pretty bullish for the mining sector overall. It's unexpected, an unexpected benefit because we're all so focused on Asia uh, and we've traditionally written off the Western economies. I think the, the US could su surprise on the upside. But in terms of Europe, no one's expecting anything for a long, long time. And I think the, the potential to get some shock news out of Europe in terms of the, when it actually does structurally start coming apart, which is always a possibility, is still yet to come. And where are the deal flows happening in terms of these mining deals? We're seeing a, a, a load of mining deals across Africa. Um, Africa has had uh, an extended outbreak of peace for a long time now, and the, uh, a lot of African countries are experiencing pretty high single-digit growth rates. Um, where, the, uh, where the geology is, where the rocks are, West Africa and iron ore, that's going to be the next Pilbara Basin. Uh, the um, Matisse area in Mozambique is going to be the next bone basin. It's going to be critical for, for Indian and uh, Asian uh, supply of, of thermal and coke and coal. Uh, I think the uh, Arabian Nubian Shield is going to be a big source of, of copper and gold deposits. And also countries like the DRC, which for many years were written off by investors, are finally seeing significant multi-billion dollar deals happen on their, in their jurisdictions, despite the fact that politically they're not quite there yet. I think the, the force of capital is, is and the demand out of Asia, uh, specifically China and India, um, is very much crystallised this belief in, in Africa that they won't succeed without demand out of Asia, but uh, Asia won't succeed without supply out of Africa. So it's a lot more bilateral than it used to be. Now, a lot of African countries are very reliant on a single commodity, taking Botswana, for example, and mm. its reliance on diamonds. How important is diversification for sub-Saharan Africa? Well, in, specifically in terms of Botswana, Botswana has lived off the it's phenomenal endowment of diamonds for a long time. It's not going to be the same in 10 years' time. Botswana also has a huge endowment of coal, over 300 million tonnes of pretty high-grade thermal coal. It's landlocked. It's 1,500 kilometres to Namibia. It's 1,500 kilometres and more through Zimbabwe and, and uh, into Mozambique to get to a, a port. Uh, there's also the possibility to transfer some of that coal into, into affordable energy for a lot of African economies. But Botswana realises that it needs to probably collaborate with Zimbabwe at some stage to build a dedicated line through, um, through southern Zimbabwe and down to Maputo to be able to export their coal. But they've got a huge coal endowment and they've got a very proactive and forward-thinking intelligent government. I think they've had a great mining policy in there for years and have reaped the benefits, and other African countries could do well out of taking the example out of their book, actually. Now let's look at Mozambique, for example, with mm -hmm. its civil war recently. Well, Mozambique had a terrible time for a long time. Uh, in 2001, the IFC were introduced into Mozambique to totally rewrite their mining code. So first of all, they introduced some basic principles on ownership and security of tenure. 
They then spent what little money they had on flying a uh, survey across the whole country to give people an early indicator of what was um, geologically prospective in the country, and they made that information freely available. Uh, they um, tied up a fairly comprehensive economic um, and, and ecological impact assessment um, uh, law into the granting of the mining licenses. And ten years later, Mozambique is seeing multi, multi billion dollars of investment um, going into that country. Mozambique and GDP growth is seven and a half percent this year, conservatively, and probably north of eight percent next year. Vale just committed another six billion dollars into developing a dedicated uh, coal terminal. There'll be another dedicated coal terminal halfway down the coast at Chinde, and there'll be another dedicated coal terminal at Baira in the next decade. Lastly, have governance issues and economic policies provided a good platform for ease of foreign investment on the continent? Well, I think people are getting practical about accessing capital. Uh, they realise that there does, there, does, there does need to be some rule of law. If people want to invest in the country, they need to be, have their rights protected. Uh, so I think from a practical point of view, there are some dark spots um, uh, in terms of governance on the continent, but I think even those are, even in the case of Zimbabwe, which is something which we uh, uh, ascribe a fairly high political and geographical risk to, many mining companies wouldn't even dream of going to Zimbabwe, but ultimately the force of economics, if they look around them on their borders, they've got Mozambique, which is doing a phenomenal job of attracting foreign investment, they've got Botswana, they've got South Africa to the south. Now, it's inconceivable that that wouldn't act to change the way that Zimbabwe thinks over time and change their standards of governance. And just briefly, um, your outlook for the continent going forward? We're very bullish on Africa. We really believe in the urbanisation trend here. Um, it's not only about supplying raw materials to Asia, and there'll be a big urbanisation trend in Africa. One of our biggest investments, proprietary investments, is in African land across a number of um, African countries. We really, we really buy into that, and we think that Africa's got an incredible century ahead of it.